Greetings, welcome, welcome. This is another exciting episode of the Limitless Mind Podcast. I'm your host, Travis Magis, and we have our hostess, Apollo Sol. And today, 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 we're going to get into some pretty interesting topics. And why is this important for you? Because some of the things that we're going to address might actually point to ways to save you a lot of stress and struggle when trying to figure out the answer to your problems. See, most people like to try to find why they feel a certain way. Like, why am I always a failure at this? And why do I always get upset about that? But what I found for me is that why, although it can be helpful, doesn't solve the problem at hand. What actually solves the problem is asking what What can we do from here? What is the structure of the problem? And what can I do to change that structure? When you think about it like that, Apollo, what comes to mind? Content versus context straight away. And the way we speak to ourselves daily and the kind of inner conversations in particular that we're having. And most of the time, we don't even realize how detrimental or negative we speak about ourselves or think about ourselves it takes a lot of conscious effort to actually catch ourselves in the act and reevaluate exactly what it is that we're saying um and a lot of people may dismiss that and think oh you know it's just in a you know negative self-talk but the inner conversations that we have with ourselves is what first of all drives us in life it's what propels us into whatever direction if you will and it's all about where our beliefs come from as well so depending on your inner dialogue will inevitably affect your outer environment absolutely your inner dialogue affects your outer environment and one thing i've noticed is that a lot of people take these ideas and these concepts and they turn them into cliches so it's like we've all heard these little quotes but that's all they are they just stay as quotes they don't actually become structural belief systems that we can use so one way to help bring that into a place where it actually makes sense is to think about how this thing works so for example we only behave according to the state that we're in so if i'm depressed and i'm feeling tired there's a lot of things that i'm absolutely not gonna do right and and depression and tiredness is a state of mind Now, if I'm in a state of feeling excited and grateful, there's a whole list of of things that I'm available to do now because I have the energy to do it. See, energy doesn't come from food and it doesn't come from sleep. That's what most people think, right? I heard Tony Robbins talk about, you know, after Thanksgiving dinner, after you stuff your face, do you have a lot of energy to go do whatever, whatever? Absolutely not. And then if you sleep for... 12 hours do you wake up refreshed and full of energy (laughs) definitely not (laughs) definitely not so it's it's not from sleep and it's not from food energy comes from the state that we're in i know plenty times where the day is just kind of going along and i'll get some good news and suddenly i'm in a state now to do a whole lot more so likewise what determines what state that we're in that has everything to do with the story that's playing in our head. The words that we're using to tell the story. So the images that we're seeing and the self-talk that we're generating, this literally creates and maintains a state of mind. And depending on that state, like I said before, allows us to, to perform in one way or another. Right. It's also about attachment and detachment because people that are very attached to their physical environment or the things that they see and they're prone to reacting with their senses if they see the thing you know things that they don't like in their environment they are more prone to react negatively and then embody a quote-unquote negative state because you know that's what they're seeing and things aren't going their way so that will be due to attachment to the situation and having a desirable outcome and then perhaps also not knowing um, universal 
flaws that you know everything that is already in the 3d in, in Malkuth here around us is the after effect and it was long ago created by our emotions by the things that we think by the things that we see and the things that we hold dear with our beliefs at our core in the astral and the etheric planes oh yeah she's trying to take it to the the mystical state i'm trying to keep it pg for our new listeners <laughs> hey it's important to know right it is it is especially if you know how to work with that information and i'll definitely say that if you're in an environment that doesn't make you happy then of course it sets up that negative feedback loop right you see something that reminds you of just how unhappy you are so that's going to reflect in your head how unhappy you are and it's going to continue every single day and that's going to demotivate you it's going to take your energy away and you're not going to feel like doing anything but there is a solution to that because these are not even as i said before and i know it's going to take some time for people to really start to believe it so i'm going to repeat it a lot but the words and the definitions and the beliefs that we hold about those words literally determine what we can do i forget the name of the story um He's a very famous author. As a matter of fact, I'm going to Google it now. But it's the story of a guy who was in, uh, I believe it was Auschwitz concentration camp. Um, Frankel, Victor Frankel, I believe his name is. Let me see. Frankel. And uh, basically his story is, yeah, he was contained in one of these concentration camps. He was a psychiatrist. But anyways he knew that in order to survive he had to keep himself into a positive state and while the people around him continued to die and become more and more miserable he survived and it had a lot to do with his attitude and his approach and and what he talks about in his book is that it has everything to do with your state of mind regardless of what your outside situation is absolutely um i think a lot of people don't realize just how powerful the mind is and then it seems that a lot of people also you know waste their precious life by constantly feeling that they're the victim right and because they're just embodying that state it continues to multiply externally for example you know a, a great example of a story that you just said um happened in real life like one of my friends um unfortunately she had stage three cancer right and mm. everything was set against her but because she was so determined to survive and to beat the disease because she really wanted to continue fighting and she had you know her kids that she wanted to continue living for she managed mm -hmm. to beat it against all odds like she was quote-unquote like a, a, a miracle recovery patient and you know she's not the only example you do see that a lot in the medical fields and it's also a great example of the placebo effect where pharmaceutical companies will run trials with you know the real drug versus a sugar pill and people that sometimes take the sugar pill they unconsciously and subconsciously believe that the pill perhaps is the real deal and they will experience the same effects on their bodies um, and there was also was it a psychologist that did a test on on a patient where he managed to hypnotize him in believing that if it touches his skin um, it will blister and burn like a hot poker. Mm -hmm. So it really does go to show like how powerful our minds are. And because a lot of the times we don't know this information or we're not in control of our states or of our emotions, we tend to abuse it. And then obviously once we get the more negative effects in life, we're like, oh, why is this happening? And we don't realize mm -hmm. that we actually do this to ourselves. Absolutely. And I want to say also on that note of the placebo, it wasn't a trick. Like there have been actual studies, clinical studies back to back to back since I want to say the 60s and 70s mm. where they've used placebo. And as a matter of fact, um, I don't know if they still do it today. I think they do. But whenever they come out with a new drug, they test it against the placebo. <laughs> they test it against oh, wow. the placebo. So it's like the, the founder, the co-founder of NLP, he actually kind of got into an altercation with with the government um, because him and his partner, they actually uh, found out that by gathering a group of people 
and telling them, hey, we're going to test this placebo on you. It's literally a sugar pill, but it's going to make you feel better. They found that through hypnosis, light hypnosis, which includes even just telling somebody that this sugar pill will make you feel better, right? Make believe, imagination, whatever you want to call it, that these people began to demonstrate positive effects with just the placebo. And this started to become such a big deal that it actually contended with Big Pharma. And the government tried several times to shut their program down until eventually they were able to. They told them they couldn't do it. That's crazy because it just goes to show that, you know, your mind is so powerful and it's the soul, you know, creator in your life that it can literally heal you. Like you don't, okay, I'm not a, I'm not a doctor or a licensed professional to say this, but you know, based on the studies or the, or the information, you would assume that the mind is so powerful that it can heal you without anything external just based on you know what you're believing absolutely absolutely all hmm. well like you said i'm not a doctor or, or a physician or anything either <laughs> a little disclaimer <laughs> yeah. but for a very 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 large part very large percentage most all of the ailments and issues that we suffer from begin physiologically which means it does affect the body but it begins in the mind it begins in the thoughts and the feelings and the states that we circulate within so anger resentment hatred depression all these things if ruminated on long enough definitely have an effect on the body again these are things that are mm -hmm. clinically tested and proven in a laboratory repeatedly and when i say in a laboratory i mean they've had people come in and they gauged their results and not just sickness, but also improvement. Again, there's actual studies of, say, one of the most popular examples is of a basketball team where they had one team actually go through the exercises. They had one team imagine the exercises and one team that didn't do anything. Well, the team that did nothing, they did not improve. As a matter of fact, they decreased in their uh, scoring percentage. The team that actually practiced, they had an improvement and the team that visualized practicing they had the same amount of improvement as the team that actually practiced. Again, this is something that has been tested for decades. This isn't something I'm just making up so that it can sound cool. That's crazy. And going back to health as well, um, there's been a lot of studies to show that things like stress is actually one of the biggest causes of cancer. Like you see a lot in the medical industry and in the pharmaceutical industry. It's something that I've always been interested in and I try to you know study and have a look at both sides of the argument and for the most part in modern day science there's a lot of illnesses and diseases which are just explained as random or there is no cause sometimes it just happens right sometimes it's just you, you know unfortunate but your cells mutated and you know here you go you have cancer or you have diabetes or something like that and it seems that science in a way either through lack of knowing or unknowing fails to uh, bring to light that everything has a cause how can something exist without a cause right and think about it uh, in the western world in particular everybody is so fast-paced there's so much going on so many people are stressed have bad mental health and it all reflects on the body there's like it always has to be internal but mm -hmm. that's where the cause comes from right everything starts subjectively and then it emanates objectively so if i say everything starts subjectively i'm not just i'm not just talking about your thoughts but the subjective experience is much wider than our objective experience and for those who don't understand that language your objective experience is the experience of your five senses, just purely your tactile experience. The things you see, smell, taste, touch, hear, etc. Your subjective experience includes your interpretation of those things, right? Because nothing on the outside has any inherent meaning. The microphone in front of me, it just it's just a piece of matter. But within my subjective experience, I classify it as a microphone. And there's levels to this classification, because if I zoom out just a bit more, I'll see that this microphone has a function for me specifically. And if I continue to zoom out, I classify this as something beneficial to me or negative to me. 
And if you keep zooming out, you'll see that all of our objective experience, we have assigned meaning and value and belief. And all those things are stored within our subjective experience. So if you've got things in your objective experience that don't have any meaning inherently, yet you classify it as something dangerous and harmful and negative to you, it begins to create effects within your body. That's why it's so important to be an observer, right? It's very hard to do, granted that, you know, people are very attached to their senses and their ego and uh, the I-ness and the separation, but that's why it's so important to zoom out and be conscious of exactly what it is that you're engaging with. Mm -hmm. But it's true though, like, I, I know that, you know, I, I'm very, personally, from, from my experience, was very guilty of indulging and uh, engaging in states that are not beneficial and, and you know negative thinking to the point of where i know all this information i've had these experiences i have all these books and i still sat there and i was like what if none of this is real and this is just like you know a, a, a lie and it's just like religion and everything else and it was so detrimental that it kind of made me have a depressive state right because it just kind of like completely lost all meaning and then i realized how important it is to you know first of all zoom out and see the big picture and ah geez understand how this pattern works right because again if we go all the way up to the top past the tree past the veils of existence but the whole principle is is that the source thinks right and all of this is created and because we're part of the source we have that same power it might not be on the same scale especially because we're so weighed down by matter and senses but that power mm -hmm. is there and it only expands with awareness so at the very least just having that at the forefront of my mind really helped me to be more conscious in terms of, of what I'm consuming and what I'm thinking because even if all of this is not true and even if all of this is you know a lie there is still no harm in in thinking positively and thinking that you are able to do better for yourself yes. and I would even challenge you and say that yes it is on the same scale as God the only difference is like I mentioned we've got those layers that are stacked on top of each other and most of us are operating from a layer that is so far down close to the effect that we don't even realize the cause anymore and I think that the more mm, that we're able that's very true the more that we're able to identify our higher level meetings, higher level meanings, metacognition, and our meta states. Meta means above, right? So this is this is thinking beyond past what most most people are capable of thinking at their present state. What I mean is that we have an opinion, but guess what? You have an opinion about that opinion. Then you have an opinion about that opinion about an opinion, and it continues to move upward. And the higher mm. these levels, the the more intense the effect on the lower level. That's why I recently did just, I mentioned in a video about being a born sinner. A lot of people consider themselves as Christians and, and to accept that means that you also have to accept that you're a born sinner. So that that's a meta state. That's a meta belief because no matter what you do on your day-to-day -day basis in the back of your head, you're already a failure. You've already fucked up. So everything in your life is about playing catch up mm. and trying to uh, earn your way into being valuable so if that's behind all of your behavior what's really going on in your life yeah that's well, so again like it's going back to being very externally driven because the whole being born a sinner right that was a mm -hmm. a metaphor but people took it literally for you know if you if you're going from the church's perspective for the state for the power for the control and the people took it because, you know, they, they needed spirituality, they, they have the inert desire to know and this was presented to them as a concept and everything else was shunned, right? So, again, it's like taking the metaphor 
and applying a detrimental meaning to it which is then going to have an effect on you for the rest of your life when it doesn't even have to mean that like let's face it it probably meant you know being born a son of you know coming here in the 3d having all these senses being weighed down perhaps and not necessarily being aware of the higher planes of existence and the consciousness there but people take it literally and personally and that's a very heavy weight to carry so of course obviously it's going to affect every decision every move in your life heavy So, so what I meant when I... Like hell, what's a sin? Exactly. See, and that, that's one of the things. When I said these words in this language, most people don't unpack the language. There's just a, a bundle of feelings, right? So when you hear the word sin, no one really sits down to describe that. But we have a feeling that, oh, this is a bad thing. I'm doing bad. So we remember as children, when we did bad, we got punished. Mm. So all we can think is, we were born deserving punishment. That's what that translates to. That's crazy, because as well, like, you know, with with religion, most of the time, it's just passed down from parent to child, right? You don't really have a choice um, if, if you if you come back to a Christian family or a Muslim family or whatever, it's, it's there. And because parents, you know, think that this is the way and they know best and, you know, they don't want their kid to be a sinner and to, to burn in the fiery depths of hell, they pass on those beliefs to their children not really unpacking why they believe those things how those things are even real right they just accept it Mm. and follow it because authority told them that that's the right thing to do like i i see that in my own family for example because they're like pretty hardcore christian and the things they believe like to me now as a more rational thinking detached person i'm like absolutely mind blown that you can even have so these beliefs but, but they do that they, they are so adamant that that these things are real and that if you you know if you disrespect god or uh, if you do sin or you do a, a bad thing then he will punish you and it's like what like wh- where where did this come from <laughs> yes yes see this is exactly what i'm talking about so what kind of picture does that create so suddenly you've been thrust into this um hostile environment where any move you make you're liable to get struck down by lightning by some invisible god who's watching Mm. you and judging your every move and you don't even understand why you didn't ask for this no one really taught you the rules right just and this is exactly what i mean like this is happening in the back of our minds especially as, as christians or any people who are very religious so this is the type of thing that's governing the behavior and to add on top of that many of these so-called sins not from the bible mind you but from the people who uh control the religious systems in your community a lot of these sins are are basic natural impulses of the human so now you've got this level of confusion because you want to do something but you've been told that it's bad or wrong or worthy of Mm. punishment so now you're questioning yourself you know why am i doing this i want to be a good person but i have this natural desire it's a whole lot of cognitive dissonance going on here and that sounds like a recipe for mind yeah. control, if you ask me. Right. But it's quite funny as well, because once again, you zoom out, you just see the never ending stream of patterns and how everything mirrors itself. You have, you know, say a concept of religion and you're told that this is bad and you shouldn't do this. And humans are attaching low tier human emotional behavior on a perfect being which is contradictory in itself right that's that's a flawed way of thinking and i don't quite understand how people can't see that but you know you have that concept of religion then you have the way that parents bring you up if you do something wrong you're gonna get a belt or you're gonna get a smack or you're gonna get grounded or something taken away from you to teach you a lesson right they inflict pain religion inflicts pain in school if you if you mess up and your grades are bad you get detention you get a report card sent home and your parents are gonna probably smack you and be like why the hell are you not performing well so it's ah oh, geez i'm trying to like the way i see it and the way i'm trying to explain it is completely opposite but it's again it's like the clip off and, and the tree you have all these you know low emotional heavy dense matter like vibrations 
and then that kind of mirrors it all the way through life um, and then you have the you know the tree and the the purity of the source and what it really is and how liberating that is and it's a it's a total mirror but the patterns and the way it flows down is the same and i hope that some people that have experienced that or may see things that way internally can kind of understand what i'm saying but it truly does just continue to perfectly mirror itself down 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 the funnel as it goes along mm -hmm. down the funnel and at no point does the average human stop and think about their thinking because all of our mental and emotional resources are so caught up in trying to be good that we never stop and analyze is this even something i need to be concerned with but this is the thing right so you know take take an average christian and i'm pretty positive that they say that god is what omni omnipresent omnibenevolent what else there's like seven omnis or something that, that they've attached to god right and all powerful all knowing and all yeah all seeing, all seeing. Um, and and yeah unkillable right so even omnibenevolent right so he, he he it whatever will will love all so why the hell are people attaching human qualities of rage jealousy envy um punishment onto a quote-unquote perfect being how does that work that is such flawed logic because if if god is omnibenevolent he's not gonna you know cast his wrath down upon you because you didn't go to church and pray on a sunday or you did something sinful how does that work <laughs> but people just blindly believe it and it, it baffles me because like at one point that was me too because you know i was a kid i didn't know any better and, and these beliefs were just forced onto me like how i remember i was i was a kid and there was this cartoon on the tv um and it was about you know um these these slavic men they were farmers and it was nighttime and as they were working you know the devil appeared on on a on a hill and I was so intrigued i was like whoa like, this is so cool and the way the music you know came up and, and the animation and my christian nan like walked into the room and she was like what the hell are you watching turn it off right now and then she made me like go and stand in front of icons because in eastern orthodox we have icons depicting like saints and and jesus and whatever and she made me pray uh i guess the icons she was like oh lord like she was you know doing the, the cross on her which is you know kabbalah but she was like oh lord forgive her like she, she didn't know what she was doing and i was like ever since then i, I still can't find that cartoon like i i tried so hard to find it because i actually wanted to finish watching it but alas i haven't brought that up yet but this is what i mean it's it, it's crazy because people just blindly believe to the point of where even like i had this conversation with my family many times and she was like my nan was like oh if there's a fire you know the the two things that i would take out is the icons and, and my passport so even if there's a fire right and the flat is burning all your personal possessions everything they would still go rescue these 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 icons these yantras mm -hmm. right because that's how how much they prioritize um their faith it's it's truly crazy because they they're so wrapped up in that belief and you know it's so true to them it's so real that's what manifests in life and then when stuff goes bad oh well you know god said you know not today or you know i, I did something wrong and therefore god punished me because that's what they believe and that's what manifests i like that you uh pointed out that those are actually yantras right of course so when people one thing that people don't realize is that there's nothing new under the sun and all of this religion that we do have pushed upon the masses it's not a unique thing the religious state that we have has actually been taken and constructed from the ancient systems and these ancient systems even though they didn't have what we call psychology they had a deep understanding of the human construct which means that they understood what was going on beyond the physical they had a very comprehensive map of the subjective territory and that's really what magic is the study of the subjective territory the more that you know about your subjective experience 
the more that you control your life. Hmm. Imagine how liberating it would be to realize that it's not Sky Daddy or anybody else that's in control of your life. You know, not necessarily destiny or spooky karma or your astrology birth chart, but it's actually <laughs> you, your mind and your beliefs. Mm -hmm. What a concept. Okay, so for it to be liberating, there has to be a new meta state. Because think about it now. Here's the thing that people do. They get into this cool occult stuff but they still have the meta states of religion. So they're dealing with demons and spirits because they're being rebellious against their parents and what they were taught. But they've also got this fear of hell and being a born sinner, right? I've met lots of occultists because mm. at this point I can, I can say I've done hundreds of consultations and there's still people who are involved with spirituality who have a Christian mindset in the back of their head. So there's still people who might work with spirits and demons but still believe in jesus as their lord and savior just in case and i can say that because mm. i was like that too right for a long time i still had jesus just in case <laughs> Duh. well it's like a backup option you, you know you're afraid of of failing you're afraid of falling and there's no net to catch you so of course because your beliefs for so many years were you know engraved into thinking that yeah jesus christ for F is your only hope and your savior so you're like oh well you know if i dip my toes into the demon pool and it backfires on me i'll have jesus's silky gorgeous arms to you know catch me and take me back to heaven mm -hmm. it's, it's fear of the unknown right mm -hmm. so if if that's going on in the back of your head how can you go all in right you got one foot in the pool and one foot on the concrete <laughs> talk about you a swimmer it's because people don't know how to you know first of all change their beliefs second of all it's, it's a crazy concept in the first place because most of the time we just identify as us it takes a lot of like i said earlier consciousness and detachment to actually sit back and realize that these things are separate and they're not us we just accept it to be as part of us and then that's why it affects us for the same principle as you know if you have a negative voice in the back of your head that pops up during certain situations what are you know what's the percentage of of people sitting back and actually taking note of what that voice sounds like where it came from you know the things that it says the the way it's triggered to come up at certain situations we identify as us and that's why it's so hard to make that change and to override the beliefs Absolutely. and to you know work on your self-concept because Absolutely. we identify with all of those things and you said earlier imagine how liberating it would be to realize that you're in control now if you still got that christian religious programming it's not liberating it's terrifying but if you've successfully if you've successfully done the work to be able to restructure your beliefs at a meta state level at a higher level at the level of your thoughts about your thoughts then it becomes liberating well do you know why it would be hard as well because people would have to take responsibility for their actions yes that's why it would also be very very difficult because then you have to take that responsibility of knowing that you know the things that you're experiencing right now especially in your external 3d environment are here because of the things that you believed in and the things that you thought and you imagined and you've seen and because you're identified with those things that just kept on multiplying and multiplying and that's how your environment was formed right and that's how your environment is formed and that, that's that's where we kind of come back full circle to you creating your reality based on your subjective experience so it isn't you know so so a lot of people misunderstand things because they try to make it too dense like too simple it's not like you simply think something and it pops up in your environment it's your beliefs about reality that allow certain things to manifest for you so it's not just what you're thinking today it's what you've been thinking over time it's what you've been believing over time so it's it's state as opposed to versus you know what you're currently thinking 
in the moment it's what you embody the vast majority of the time right that pops up and manifests and solidifies and crystallizes absolutely this is what it means this is your frequency how frequently you do a thing so if your frequency is i'm a piece of shit every day every day every day every day <laughs> then all of a sudden i'm god which one of those you think are gonna last <laughs> <laughs> So earlier I said that, um, you know, most people identify with the world around us and they don't realize that this is the after effects and, you know, the beginnings and the origins long ago already happened in the ether and in the astral. How would somebody go about, you know, being more in control of what they start to create in the astral and in the ether? Okay, so your immediate access to the astral plane is your control of your states. Your states are a low level reflection of what's happening in the astral plane. As I've said before, on all levels, physical, etheric, astral, mental, spiritual, causal, all five levels can be accessed. But on that particular plane, that specific plane is the strongest. I said that to say that from the physical plane you can still access the etheric the astral the mental the spiritual and your access to the astral plane in the physical plane is your control of your states now the astral plane itself is it, just like on the physical plane we've got different continents and on each continent you'll find different territories with different customs and different peoples in the astral plane you're going to find different territories of states that exist independently of an individual. So there is an astral reality of love, an astral reality of anger and hate. There's an astral reality of being horny, right? And then within those states, there are smaller territories and even citizens and denizens. And when we want to feel something, we attach to one of them specifically. So in order to really control your reality from that level, you've got to start becoming more in control of the states that you embody on a regular basis. Mm. So essentially these are like pockets, if you will, of, of this, you know, frequency of this energy. And they're not necessarily a part of us, but it's down to what we tap into, right? With our, with our states, because even as we're living our day-to-day -day life, all of this is going on internally, right? Mm-hmm. And as a matter of fact, you said that they're pockets. We have a passport to all of these places. We've got a, a passport, an all access pass to all these places. So you really got to consider why it is that you only choose to go to certain territories because you're familiar, right? You only, you, mm -hmm. you have one specific grocery store you go to, even though there's all these others, you have one that you pretty much shop at. So how would one go about changing their state? Let's start at the easiest point, which is the words that you use in your language. Because the words you use control your emotions and your state. I worked, you know, I do consultations every day. I had a client today and he mentioned he's been doing shadow work and he's doing an excellent job. I'm really proud of him. And he mentioned how today um, his, his sister was talking to him, blah, blah, blah. And then she's like, girl, she called him a girl, basically. That's just how she talks. <laughs> and he got upset. He felt a, a, a moment of rage there. And since he did emasculated, since he did the shadow work, he understood where it was coming from. He associated being called a girl or anything feminine with weakness. And a lot of men have this belief that things that are feminine are inherently mm -hmm. weak. So it translated to him, that word translated to him that she was attacking his masculinity, like you said. So we had to really dig deep and analyze that, right? And he brought this all the way back home to a point where he remembered being on the football team at a very young age. And he realized it was a bit too rough for him, right? Everybody's not cut out for football. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. I told a story once of how I mm. got into the band. I thought that I was playing music in the band in middle school because I love music. No, I was on the football team and my aunt and my uncle hyped me up. Go, oh, go, you can do it, you can do it. There was this massive kid, like three times my size. And they're telling me, go, go get him, go get him. 
<laughs> no. And I run up to this kid and he sits on me, damn near crushes me into the ground. And when I woke up, I had a tuba in my hand. Right? I'm in the band now. <laughs> no more football. <laughs> I didn't, that was an uncovered memory. I didn't realize that. Likewise for him, he realized that football wasn't his thing. But there was a kid in his class who consistently picked on him. He kept calling him weak. He kept calling him a girl. He kept calling him all these other names. And that level of teasing left an impression on him. So whenever anyone mentions anything like that, it brings back that state. So what we had to do was really Mm. start to reframe girl and femininity. But before we even went that far, we found the positive intention of what why he left football and also the positive intention of that kid what do you think the positive intention was of the child who was teasing him probably to feel better about himself that's one (laughs) or to you know sometimes when people tease um it's because they want to be seen as popular in front of you know the people that they're teasing there's all sorts of reasons. It's also a possibility that maybe he wanted him back on the football team with him. That's true. So by expanding the perspective, we start to see that it's not all bad, that there may have been other factors contributing to the experience. Now, this doesn't forgive what happened, but but by understanding it from a higher level, you can start to release these negative feelings that you've chosen to cling to. So then we start redefining and re. We start reframing the, the language being used in order to add more uh, more detail and more options to the story that we're telling ourselves. Because if, if his sister's a girl, I'm sure she wouldn't be using that as an insult since she herself is a girl. You know, it's quite funny how in the ages where, you know, our, our minds are most shaped and we absorb everything like a sponge and um we can truly unlock some some great states for our future adult life it's it's also the time where it seems that we're most negatively affected by um not so productive parenting and like-minded you know peers in school in particular with bullying and, and things like that like when the mind is most malleable for beliefs for really setting yourself up to you know reach your full potential we are often limited like from the get-go yes yes this is where it starts but that's not where it ends it's quite interesting if that's people's you know if that's people's karma or if that's just you know the the pocket of frequency that they've happened to come into because it's, it's a common occurrence, right? It's not a rare thing, like, it, especially in the Western world, it's all down from, from parenting and childhood experiences. Absolutely. It's extremely common. As a matter of fact, it's the norm. So, bearing all this in mind, and, you know, the heavy traumas that children can go through, that they never truly resolve and they carry this baggage into adult life how would you say you know or what what would you say is the best way to start changing the language that we use because you know it's, it's easier said than done especially when you've been repeating it for so long and um it is pretty much unconscious to the point of you know if you say if you do something wrong right you automatically think or say oh i'm so stupid or you know wow i can't believe i did this like i'm so silly and we know it's detrimental and we know that it affects everything around us but what would be the best way to start slowly changing those years of unproductive programming it starts with looking in that mirror see we're for the most part too busy running around reacting to reality we've got to be able to find a way to sit still and analyze our behavior in the moment When you start to analyze your behavior in the moment, you can start to trace where this behavior was inspired by, 
and where that inspiration came from and where that inspiration came from. We're not looking for why, we're looking for how, and we're looking for what is actually happening. When you can find the structure of how you create your problematic states, these are actually called strategies, by the way, right? People who are able to uh, go into anxiety, who suffer from anxiety a lot, they're extremely skilled at putting themselves into that state. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a strategy that they use. They see something, they hear something, they think something, and it leads them down a trail and a path of going into a state of anxiety. So if we're able to stop and analyze the steps that lead you to anxiety. So here's the thing, you, you say that it happens automatically. We talk about these people acting on autopilot, but that's only, that, that's a misnomer. Mm -hmm. It's a misuse of the word. It's not actually autopilot. It just happens so fast, it's subliminal. It happens below the liminal threshold. Mm. It happens so fast that the conscious mind can't pick it up. That's because we've been doing it so much, so well, that the neurological pathway from being okay to being anxious is uh, so strengthened, we can get there in the blink of an eye. So if we're able to stop and be in the moment, we can start to become aware of that process as it happens and start to backtrack. Okay, so right now I'm feeling anxious. What made me feel this way? Okay, I saw this. I thought that. I'm having this feeling. Okay, this is leading to this state. Why? Okay, well, because this. You see, so when you start breaking it down like that, what's actually happening is you're mm -hmm. disassociating yourself from the emotion mm -hmm. instead of just purely experiencing the emotion. Does that make sense? Hmm. Yeah, because in a way as well, like as you cleared that up, that's also good news because, you know, unconsciously we do a lot of things like we, we breathe, we blink, our heart continues to beat. So it's a good thing that, you know, it's not like that and it can be changed to benefit yes. us it's not a part of our core genetic makeup if you will for survival it's something that we've adapted over the years and it can be plucked out like a weed yes it most certainly can be plucked out like a weed we are not our behaviors our behaviors are just things that we do what we are is pure energy but to identify ourselves with a behavior that would be a grave mistake hmm. and again it all goes down to self-concept right and your beliefs shaping everything around you and how important it is to have that strong solid state and belief in yourself yes interesting yes it truly is all connected i love it i love it because instead of just being out here lost and confused there's mm. actually a game plan there's actually a structure right So I think the point that we're trying to make is that if you're somebody that feels like you have no control in your life or you have no control over your beliefs, there is techniques, there are ways to get out of that state, to start to implement change. And then, you know, mo most people want to see change in their, in their environment, right? In their sensory experience. And that can be done through your inner world and there are certain techniques and implementations that you can carry out that are effective and are proven to do so so there really is no need for you to feel so hopeless yes. and you know so so bummed out about life and oh i'm never coming back here again and i'm not reincarnating here because this place sucks like it doesn't have to be like that you can program yourself to have a more right. enriching and beneficial experience Hmm. And it should be that way. It's not people's fault though. Like in in the environments that we grew up, like not many people know this information. It's occult for a reason. It's hidden, right? So it's it's just what's passed down. And because we're so malleable at such a young age, we just absorb this without questioning it. Because how can we? You know, we're, we're kids and parents know better. And that's where the authority thing comes in. But it, it is possible to undo all those years of unuseful behavior and embody something much more appropriate as you navigate through life yes it's not whether or not it's good or bad is it useful or is it appropriate 
there is no good or bad. It's subjective, case by case basis. Mm -hmm. Hmm. I think that we've actually really touched on some things that I'm just going to be honest, are life changing because just like what you said, there's, these are things that people don't think about on a daily basis. So if you heard something here that resonated with you, mm. take it seriously, consider it and see how it might fit into your life, into your structure. Because when you start analyzing yourself, when you start operating from a moment of presence, being in the moment, you're no longer operating on autopilot. And this is how you begin to heal yourself because you can catch yourself before you start going into a downward spiral into a negative state. I think, you know, it, it can seem very daunting and difficult to detach from all this baggage that we've carried around, right? And we almost adopt these beliefs and we make it a part of ourselves and we never really question you know why they're here or where they came from but you know that that's not maybe necessarily even the most important part the most important part would be just to analyze that they're there and to understand that they are not a part of you they are just a learned new algorithm that you've adopted based on the things that you've experienced and you know like we said over the entirety of the episode you can change that so just by even making the very first small step i would say start to be more aware of the things that you think and you say about yourself and be more conscious of those processes and in your day-to-day -day life every time you're about to say something you know berating or negative um, about you catch yourself and think the opposite um, it's, it's something that's called a, a mental diet and just by carrying out such a small change it will build up eventually and have a much larger impact on your life both internally and externally. There is no need for you to berate yourself or to call yourself stupid or, or dumb or weak or ugly or whatever it is that people assign to themselves. We are just the way we are and we assign whatever meaning we want to things in our life and to ourselves so again if both positive and negative if you will exist right if both chances of winning or losing exist and there's a 50 50 chance of it happening why choose the losing side why choose the losing side I love it because this gives answers, right? This gives answers instead of just problems consistently. That's what it's all about. Mental diets, very important. We, we go on diets for our bodies, right? But mm -hmm. when do we ever go on a mental diet? Never. <laughs> People also fail to, you know, realize that the mental state yes. is, a, is a body too. We don't see it that way because again, we're so focused on the sensory experiences. I mean, eventually we'll get to that point where like, you know, maybe you'll get so sick and tired of berating yourself or being depressed or negative. You're just like, well, you know, screw this. I'm, I'm going to choose to be happy because I have nothing to lose. I mean, what do you have to lose? Right. Just a negative state. That's it. And you know, just keep in mind also, psychology tells us that, I forget the name of this rule, but most of us are more afraid to lose what we have than to try something new. So people will cling tightly to what they have mm. before they try something new. That's, that's literally... Mm -hmm everything and that's you know it's, it's almost like going back to the beginning of the episode where you said that you know you had jesus at the back of your mind because you were afraid to try something new and that's with that's with everything in life that's techniques new jobs relationships you know everything because people cling on to what they know even if it's detrimental and it no longer serves them rather than you know jump into something new <sighs> gotta love it the more you know 
So from this point, I want to say thank you all for tuning in to this podcast. And honestly, I really do hope that you're able to pick up something from here that you're able to utilize in your daily life. If nothing else, just consider the words that you're using. Consider the thoughts that are going through your head. And maybe take a note of the different states that you find yourself in on a weekly basis, right? What are, what are all the different emotions that you feel on a regular basis? And maybe start to analyze what triggers those feelings, good and bad, and also indifferent. Hmm. And start to believe that you deserve to have better things in life. You don't need to achieve you know, a certain number in your bank account. You don't need to look a certain way. You are enough just the way you are. You truly can have whatever you desire as you are in the way that you are and you do not need anything extra. I like that. I like that. All right. So again, I appreciate you guys tuning in. We appreciate you guys tuning in. Mm -hmm. You have uh, all kinds of things that you could have been doing with your hour, but you chose to spend it with the lovely Travis Magus and Apollo Soul. So please. And hopefully you learn something new. Hopefully you learn something new. Enjoy your day. And check out the next exciting episode of the Limitless Mind Podcast. Be sure to check us out on social media. You can find me on Instagram at LVX777. And also, you can easily find me everywhere else. Just type in Travis Mages, YouTube, and all that other stuff. Mm. And I'm on Instagram under underscore underscore Apollo Soul. And thank you so much for taking your time to tune in and listen to this podcast. Peace.